The intersection of Mass Ave and Melnia Cass Boulevard has long been a gathering point for the homeless and people struggling with substance use disorder. The intersection has long been a source of complaints from local businesses and residents in surrounding neighborhoods, and the problems have since commanded even more attention due to enforcement measures and a recent attack on a corrections official. Our guest has also been concerned about the area as a physician at Boston Medical Center and currently is the area's state representative. We'd like to welcome John Santiago. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. Great. Today. Thanks for having me. First of all, you, you also jog by this every morning. Uh, what do you see? Well, you know, it's an interesting place, to say the least. I, as you said, I'm the state representative there. It's within the district. I live about a mile away from where the incident took place, and I, you know, a block away from Mass Ave. You I jog, jog on in the Atkinson morning. Street, right? Yeah, and I jog it in the morning. You know, I just do a daily jog around the district to see what's going on, get some exercise. And what's going on there, particularly over the last year or so, it's just gotten worse. And it's hard to tell um, what has, qualitatively, you can tell. Um, but every summer it gets worse. People are outside more. I mean, we, the, the emergency department gets busier. You know, the gunshots in the community go up. Um, but also in the case of Atkinson Street, it's gotten worse. But for some reason this summer, I feel it's gotten worse. And you hear it from the community members, from the neighbors who live in the area, that things have just gotten worse. Uh, talk about the things, because, I mean, I've heard things, whether it's needles in playgrounds or, or somebody in Franklin Square. Uh, what, what are people telling you? So it's really a combination of all of the above. I mean, this is not just an opioid use issue. This is an issue of housing. Um, this is an issue of mental health and how we can provide better services to these people. I think what a lot of people don't understand is how complicated these patients are. I mean, we're dealing with a trifecta of housing, mental health, instability, and opioid use disorder. And to say that we just need services, I think we need to be, as public officials, as policymakers, very intentional about what that means and need to be innovative and strategic about um, the services to them. Because all these people will just end up in the emergency department. I mean, I jog that area and I'll see my patients. And they'll come in after an overdose and I'll see them jogging, or I'll, I'll, be, I'll see them while I'm jogging, or I'll see them as patients the next day or so with another overdose. Why is it that we have revolving door health care? Well, it, it's a very complicated issue. Um, it's one that's been studied. It's a very difficult one to address. I think in the setting of a worsening opioid epidemic, I mean, we have to realize that 90% of the overdoses that we see, it's fentanyl. I mean, the epidemic has changed just over the last couple of years. So you have a stronger drug, you have one that's shorter acting, and one that's more deadly. And so the strategies have to change with that. So you have a worsening fentanyl epidemic, and you have a housing crisis. You have the Long Island issue as well. As you know, when the bridge closed down, you know, hundreds of people within days or so moved into the south end. So you have an explosive community there uh, in terms of people requiring services. And it's been difficult given, given the heightened um, fentanyl epidemic. There's also an impassioned debate about whether there should be medically supervised injection sites. Do you have any feelings one way or the other about You know, that? as a physician and as a scientist, you know, I look at data and I read it and, you know, it suggests to me that it could work. I mean, we're in the game of saving lives. When I'm in the state house or in the hospital, uh, my number one interest is how do we save more lives. And given the rise of fentanyl, um, we really have to consider um, all options and have all, everything uh, considered. And so I actually co-sponsored a, a safe injection um, piece of legislation that would give cities the authority to kind of pursue that option. And for people who don't follow this as closely, why does it fentanyl change the game so much around injection? It's just a stronger, it's 50 to 100 times stronger than heroin. And so oftentimes people will shoot up and within, you know, seconds, minutes of their lives, their breathing slows down, they have some respiratory depression, and they die uh, before they can access Narcan or before someone can help them out. And so, you know, if we're in the game of saving lives, I mean, people can't go into recovery if they're dead. And so, as you know, safe injection sites have been studied in Canada and Europe and Australia, and there's some evidence to say that they do work. Um, you know, but we have to be very uh, comprehensive in this approach. This is not about sticking a safe injection site in the South End. I mean, uh, we have to be broad, comprehensive. We have to increase regional capacity. We have to make sure people have a place to go um, after detox. Um, one thing I'm very interested in is how do we expand medication-assisted treatment across the state? in other cities and towns across the Commonwealth where people can access these services where they live and where they work and where their support networks exist because we can't continue to um, concentrate that area of mass and cast um, with services because um, we'll end up with what we have right now, which isn't working for anyone. This is being the news and we're talking with State Representative John Santiago. I, I want to come back to uh, where the people who are congregating around this intersection uh, should go because if they stay there, you get complaints, other people get complaints, 
Uh, and if they're dispersed, then the complaints just get relocated. Uh, is, is there any way around that? Well, I don't think we should necessarily be looking at it about whether they should be there or whether they should not be there. Obviously, there is a concentration of people there. When I jog the area, I'll see 200 plus people just hanging around. I think it's, you know, we have to look uh, at what these people need and where they can get the, the best care for them, whether that's uh, in a presumed uh, Long Island recovery campus or something in the Shattuck or something in their you know, city or town. Um, these people are very complex, and I think, again, we get lost, and you know, we throw the buzzword, more services, more services. But these people require um, very um, uh, high needs. For example, in the emergency department, we have a program where if a high utilizer, someone who visits the emergency department quite a bit, if they show up to my ED, there's a green flag that lights up, and then I'll know that's a complex uh, patient requiring um, uh, important needs, and a case manager will come speak with them to help them kind of um, understand what's going on, maybe get other people on board to see what's going on. The 200 people hanging around Atkinson Street aren't necessarily using all the services there. Um, you know, when I walk the streets, I see active drug dealing, I see sex trafficking. Um, it's, you know, it can be a dangerous place. And it's one that um, it's just going to require a lot of support and help from the city, from the state, and from everyone. Uh, what do you think about the rationale that you need to get in there and crack down on some of the people who are preying on, I guess, the larger population gathered there? Well, I mean, I think there's a fine line between public safety and, and public health. And I think that's what the mayor attempted to do. You know, I think the mayor and, and, you know, and the public officials across the Commonwealth agree we can't arrest our way out of this. Um, but not everyone there is simply a homeless person. Um, there were some characters there that were concerning. Um, I mean, people trying to get services, trying to go to the methadone center. And could you imagine in recovery attempting to get your services, whether it's a, a group to talk to or methadone, and people coming up to you, accosting you, wanting to give you, wanting to give you drugs? And people were actively shooting up there. And again, a very complex situation. And given the concentration of services there, it makes it worse. Uh, of course, one other thing that grabbed a lot of attention and a lot of people didn't like to see was the pile of wheelchairs in the trash yeah. truck. I know the police said that one of those chairs was, was not usable yeah. and uh, very unhealthy. But, I mean, what was your take back from that? You know, it's interesting because I see many wheelchairs when I walk around there. And to be just very frank with you, I mean, if you were to jog that every day before this happened, I mean, there are a number of wheelchairs there strewn out, not used. I mean, these are all BMC wheelchairs, you know, wheelchairs that come from the emergency department, BMC property, and, and people would use them. And, you know, I still walk the community. I still see wheelchairs hanging around, um, trash um, that should be picked up. Now, in the case of this one person who may have lost his wheelchair or, or his wheelchair was taken from him, my guess is that the city um, would do what they can to make sure that, those, that it would make amends for that and that that was a mistake. Again, I don't think the city was out there picking up people and throwing them out of wheelchairs. Um, and, um, you know, wreaking havoc across the, the, that part of the area. One of the other things, I, and I think this is partly a problem for you, too, uh, you have different camps that you have to represent, whether it's people uh, in the South End or in Roxbury, or the people gathered around that intersection who feel that this is where they live, and... Well, this is where I live. Uh, right, exactly. I mean, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah, oh, yeah, I you're, you're one of them, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I see and, issues from a quality of life perspective. The need to, I mean, I, don't, I just had someone email me recently about... You know, thanking me for something I did, and and she said it's the first time she had to speak to her you know five year old son about good needles and bad needles, and it's a reality whether you're black, white, or or whatever in the community, um, and so we have to find a way to balance the quality of life issues with what's going on, but make no mistake, uh, you know, if we can provide more services, be intentional, be innovative, I think we can get people the care they need, and 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 if other parts of the city and town. Uh, towns across the Commonwealth can do their role. I think we can begin to decompress places like Mass and Cass. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. State Representative John Santiago. In a moment, we'll talk with a candidate for City Council in District 8.